All right. So I think that it is time to get started. I'm showing that it is 11 o'clock. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Thomas Cameron. Uh, I am a global cloud strategy evangelist at Red Hat. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about container security. I'm reusing a presentation that I used at DockerCon this year because uh, Marunal Patel and I uh, collaborated on it. And he filled in a lot of the gaps, honestly, that I had with my knowledge. I am very much from the system administration, systems engineering background, but he is a developer. And so I was able to you know, shamelessly pick his brain <laughs> for some of the content here. What we'll be talking about today is what are containers, or actually, I'm sorry, a little bit about me and a little bit about Red Hat and then a little bit about uh, where, where containers came from and what Red Hat has been doing with containers. We'll talk about what containers are, <laughs> how they work. We'll talk about what containers are not because I think there is still some confusion about uh, when to use containers, when to use virtualization, whether they're the same thing and so on. Uh, and then I'll talk about the components which make up container security. Uh, we'll talk about kernel namespaces, we'll talk about Linux control groups, we'll talk about the Docker daemon and how it works and the security that it provides. Uh, and then we'll talk about Linux kernel capabilities and security enhanced Linux, how it works, uh, why it matters. Uh, and then I'll talk about a few tips and tricks with container security and then draw some conclusions. So as far as who I am, um, as I said, my name is Thomas Cameron. I'm a cloud strategy evangelist at Red Hat. I've been working in information technology since 1993. Um, the reason that I enjoy security is that I actually started my career out of school as a police officer. I, I really enjoy law enforcement and forensics and security. So um, I'm kind of a, kind of a weird hybrid. I, I come from a security background, but now I'm a computer geek. Um, <clears throat> I've been with Red Hat since 2005. Uh, I am a Red Hat certified architect. I'm a Red Hat certified security specialist. Um, and I have other certifications and I've been in IT for long enough that I actually have a very strong background in Microsoft security uh, And before that I was a Novell certified network engineer. So I'm really dating myself there. I remember IPX and SPX <laughs> um, And I have spent a lot of time focusing on security in environments like financial services and retail and manufacturing and things like that. So I certainly do not claim to know everything. I've been at Red Hat for long enough to know that no matter how much I learn, there's always somebody who knows a lot more than I do and I always have something to learn. So let's talk a little bit about Red Hat and what we've been doing with containers. Red Hat has actually been working on containerization since 2010 or a little bit before. Uh, we acquired a company in 2010 called Makara. And Makara, uh, Makara uh, was a, a platform as a service company. Uh, when we bought Makara, we liked what they were doing, but we really uh, we re rewrote it and rebranded it as Red Hat OpenShift. Um, Makara had technology that really was analogous to containers today, uh, except they called them cartridges. Those cartridges used security enhanced Linux. They used Linux control groups and kernel namespaces. Uh, but what happened was that as, as tends to happen in the open source community, open source is really a meritocracy. So even though we liked the technology that we started working with with Makara, in about 2013, the, the community and the industry really started um, showing that what Docker was doing made a lot of sense. So we rebranded OpenShift uh, to use Docker as an underlying cartridge technology, and we started participating in the Docker community. And the last time I checked, we were the number two contributor to the upstream Docker project. So we're very actively involved. Uh, and that's not a, oh, look at Red Hat, we're the number two contributor. Oh, it is a, we recognize that we have a responsibility to the greater community to be good stewards of the code. And so we contribute as much as we can upstream to make sure that we are being those good stewards of the code. Uh, and Docker as a company is actually doing some pretty incredible things. Um, they've been through multiple successful rounds of venture capital uh, raising uh, and companies like uh, Absera and Cisco and Goldman Sachs and Intel and Pivotal and also Red Hat are all on board with container standardization with Docker as a standard container format. Even Microsoft has announced that they will support Docker formats. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what containers are. Containerization 
specifically Docker, is really just a technology that allows you to have applications, whether they're web servers, for instance, databases, application servers, to run abstracted from and in some isolation from the underlying operating system. The Docker service can launch containers regardless of the underlying uh, operating system or the underlying Linux, uh, Linux distribution. Containers can do some amazing things. They can provide, they can drive very uh, high levels of application density, so you can run a whole lot of applications on a single machine because you don't have the overhead of doing full virtualization on, you know, for every application. Um, Linux control groups also enable you to really maximize utilization. A lot of times we think about control groups as stopping something from, from taking too many resources. But the counter to that is that Linux control groups also allow you to really manage utilization. Because I know that, let's say I've got a system that's got 32 gigs of memory, and let's say I'm gonna grant, just for a nice round number, one gig of memory to, all, to each of my applications, that means that I know for sure that I can have at least 31 applications, because I wanna reserve some for the operating system, but it allows you to be very granular in your control of the underlying systems now, really, we know that if we've got one gig per application, not all applications are going to use that full gig. So the point is, you can be very, very precise in how you allocate resources using containers. And the same container can run on different versions of Linux. You can run you know, an Ubuntu container on Fedora, or a Fedora container on Ubuntu, or a CentOS image on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It's very, very flexible, and it allows for uh, the distribution of containers across pretty much any version of Linux that you have as long as you've got the right version of Docker. Now, that leads to the question, what are containers not? Well, containers are not the cure to all that ails you. Uh, in the American West, there, there was a joke about snake oil salesmen. That people would sell snake oil and say, it'll cure everything from bad breath to cancer. And so a lot of times I see people saying containers are the fix for everything. Maybe not, maybe not. Um, there are a lot of things that containers can do, but they are not a panacea, they don't do everything. Containers are not yet a fit for every application out there. There are application vendors who simply won't, won't support their application in a container. Um, there are some applications which don't lend themselves to containerization. If you have a really massive monolithic you know, application uh, or like a giant, database or something like that, they're not necessarily a good fit for containerization. And containers are not virtualization. I hear a lot of people making the comparison of containers to virtual machines. Really not the same. I run containers on my bare metal operating system on this laptop all the time, so it does not need to be uh, virtualized. So let's talk a little bit about some of the features of containerization. The first one that I want to talk about is kernel namespaces. Namespacing is just a way to make a global resource appear to be unique and isolated inside of a process or to a process. The container or the namespaces that the Linux kernel can manage include mount namespaces, process ID namespaces, uh, Unix time sharing namespaces, IPC inter process communication namespaces, network namespaces, and user namespaces. All processes belong to exactly one each of these namespaces. So a process that calls unshare, uh, that calls this the unshare system call with clone new arguments will get its own isolated instance of a namespace. A clone or fork system call can also be used to spawn a process in its own namespace. So let's drill down a little bit into what each of these namespaces mean. So mount namespaces, uh, just a collection of file system mounts that make up a process's view of the file system hierarchy. The root of a container is made up of the files packaged by the container author. So when you create your container, you're gonna you know, have a, a root file system for instance, um, and then other mounts can be added to the mount namespaces of the container for security and convenience. Slash proc, for instance, is mounted so that the containers can see the process is running inside of its own PID namespace. So when you look at the proc namespace inside of a uh, container, you only see those processes for that container, not processes outside of it. Um, and then things like uh, slash proc slash pts slash ptmx is mounted so that the container gets to spawn its own isolated uh, pseudo terminals. 
Uh, and then some locations like Proc K Core are masked over with dev null so that containers cannot access raw memory. You don't want to have containers being able to get to any memory outside of just that container namespace. And then some uh, locations such as, such as Proxys are made read only as SysFS isn't really completely virtualized yet. And so I've got an example here, and I'm sorry this is kind of a, a dense, but you can see that the that crazy long UUID from the parent or from the host that the container is running on gets mounted as root. And then you can see that proc is mounted and dev is, all of these are, are mounted and they're very similar to what you would see in the host operating system, but these are isolated so that inside of the container, you only see those file systems which are uh, abstracted through the mount namespace. That's a security thing. We don't necessarily want the container to be able to see anything that's on the host operating system unless you mount a file system from the host within the guest uh, at runtime. So when you do docker run dash it and you can do a, you can mount you know var www html for instance or, or something like that. But the whole point is you don't want the container to see the contents of the host operating system unless you explicitly allow it. The mount namespaces is how we do that abstraction. Process ID namespaces or PID namespaces just isolate the PID numbers inside of the container from the PID numbers on the host. So for instance, I've got a, a, an example here where I do Fedora or docker run dash IT Fedora and I just run the bash command. When I do a PSAX inside, the container thinks that bash is process ID number one. Well, we all know that that's not really process ID number one, but process ID namespaces take that bash command right there and tell from tell inside of the container, yeah, yeah, it's number one, that's your only, uh, only process, where the reality is it's really process ID 18596 on the host. The whole point here again is we want the container to not have awareness of what's going on on the host. So if something bad happens in the container, it can only affect those process IDs which are abstracted or, or presented to that container. User namespaces just map UIDs and GIDs so that inside of the container, um, I can have a UID or a GID that appears inside the container to have root privileges and in fact does have root privileges inside of the container, but they don't have root privileges outside or on the host. So as an example here, um, you can actually add like uh, ranges if you want to. Um, and the challenge really with user namespaces is that, or, or one of the benefits of having user namespaces is that if I spin up 50 containers, inside of each of those 50 containers, there'll be a UID zero or root access, but um, user namespaces are what's going to map that to the user that actually spawned that, uh, that container. So again, it's isolated. Um, and um, one of the things that Marunal was talking about when we presented this is layer sharing. Uh, we're still doing some work on that. The ability to do sharing of, of you know, the layers within containers uh, and it still needs to have some work done in the uh, VFS, the virtual file system. So he did this example where he used uh, OCI tools generate U UID mappings. And so basically what you can see is he runs the run C uh, command and just runs the test command. And you can see that the mapping of that UID zero inside of the guest is mapped to UID 1000 or a regular user account outside. So that's how you can have root access inside of your container, but still not be able to compromise the host that it's running on. And again, this is all based on, I mean, this is all with an eye towards security. We want to give you as many privileges inside of the container as you need to do what you need to do, but we don't want you to be able to compromise the host. Interprocess communication namespaces, same concept. Um, it's just masking IPCs so that within the container, the table of interprocess communications that you see appears to be global, but it's really not. It's just those within your container. So in this case, I run a, a, a bash instance on a Fedora container. I run IPCS, and according to what's going on inside of the computer, I don't have any interprocess communications mapped. Whereas the truth is on the host that's running that container, you know, I've got zillions of them. Uh, so IPC, again, we just want to make sure that we've isolated what's going on inside of the container so that it can't see what's going on on the host so we can't have any of that interaction. 
Now changing gears a little bit, talking about control groups, Linux control groups. Um, essentially, control groups are just a mechanism for aggregating or partitioning sets of tasks. Um, including their children into hierarchical groups of specialized behavior. So basically that allows system resources like CPU or memory, disk IO, network IO, etc., into a control group and you can assign limits to that. The big benefit of that is that if something happens to a process that's inside of a control group, because we have limits on that control group, even if somebody does something really fancy, you know, every year when we get a next, our next uh, group of graduates, um, they're like, oh, I developed this cool attack called a fork bomb. <laughs> yeah, it's not very creative. People have done it before. But the cool thing is, if you run that within a control group, you might exhaust the resources for that one control group, but you're not going to take down the rest of the system. So um, even if a container is compromised or even if you just have poorly written code, right? Because we're humans, we make mistakes, people are going to do silly things that misbehaved container should not be able to uh, impact the host or other containers. So if I do a uh, system control status docker.service, I'll get the control group and slice information. So this is what that looked like. So I just do system control status docker and I can see where it's running and you can also see what control groups, um, including the fact that that is an SE Linux enabled control group, that the master Docker service is running in, and then each Docker instance after that will also get its own control group. So you can navigate through the Proxys C group pseudo directory to see what resources are allocated. Now there are over 8,500 of them, so it doesn't make sense for me to try to go into all of them, but like I said, you can go in there and you can see every container, every um, process, and if you do, like I did a find command and piped it to wc-l, there's over 8,500 just on my little laptop. So you can imagine that it gets pretty crazy. Um, <clears throat> now what I did in this example was I did um, Docker run IT and I'm limited to only 100 megs of memory, an instance of a Fedora container running bash. And so you can see that if I look at proc one C group, I can see all of the various control groups and the slices that are allocated to that container. You see that they're all roughly, the, I mean, it's all the same scope. Um, but the cool thing about this is that if I look at um, memory limit in bytes, for instance, I can see what my memory limit is. I've only got 100 megs of memory available to that container. And in this case, what I did was I, I said, uh, basically I did a fork bomb inside of my container. And so essentially what happens is after a very limited amount of time, that, that Docker image dies and it exits back out to a command prompt. So essentially, even though I did a fork bomb and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm gonna take down the whole system. Now what winds up happening is, if you look in the log file, the out of memory killer gets invoked for that one container. And so the nice thing is, we kill that container, the rest of the operating system is unaffected. So that's what that allows you to do. If the limit is higher than resources. I'm sorry? If the limit is higher uh, than resources. We will give you the gun. We will tell you where your foot is. What you do after that is up to you. <laughs> huh, that's interesting. I lost the image. Hmm. There was a pretty picture there. We're going to move on. <laughs> All right. So moving on to um, changing gears a little bit, the Docker daemon itself. The Docker daemon is responsible for managing those control groups, for um, orchestrating namespaces, and so on, so that you can run images um, using the Docker daemon. Now, Docker, because we are doing things like accessing network and storage and things like that, does run with root privileges, so be aware of that. There are some considerations for running Docker. Um, only allow trusted users to run Docker. Uh, older Docker documentation, like when I first started playing with Docker, had you add a user to the Docker group so you could spin up Docker instances as a regular user. At Red Hat, we don't allow regular users from running Docker, so you have to give them privileges either through sudo or some other mechanism. Um, only delegate the, the ability to run <laughs> Docker images to trusted users. Um, and remember that they can mount the host file systems in their container potentially with root privileges. So just be aware of that. If you are using the REST API to manage Docker, which is very, very common, uh, make sure that you are um, using the latest versions of all the Docker uh, software. Um, don't, 
Don't have any vulnerabilities exposed. In other words, keep your systems up to date. Uh, make sure that you have strong authentication, preferably uh, including either only VPN or using TLS or SSL or something like that. What is going on with my images? That's really weird. I promise this worked just a little while ago. Hmm. I don't know. So we're going to talk about Linux kernel capabilities. I'm not sure why that text got all wonky. Uh, so we're going to change, change gears a little bit and talk about Linux capabilities. So historically, the root user had the ability to do anything. Once you have root privileges, you can have complete access to the system. Um, but Linux capabilities breaks root privileges into 38 distinct controls that can be enabled or disabled independently. This allows one to grant only those privileges required for uh, somebody to do a job, whether it's a task or uh, uh, logging in or whatever. But the cool thing about Linux capabilities is you can use them to take away privileges that the root user has, but you can also use Linux capabilities to grant privileges to a non-root user. Uh, for instance, you could do something like, say, a regular user can bind to uh, uh, a privileged port, a port under 1024. Uh, so there are a lot of neat things that you can do with Linux capabilities. Um, the default list is a minimal list that works for most applications. There is a catch-all capability called capability sysadmin. Um, with Docker, we drop that because that is kind of a catch-all. It's like, well, I'm not sure where this capability should fit in with the rest of Root's privileges, so I'm just going to put it in cap sysadmin. So because that is a catch-all, uh, we disallow or we disable those capabilities for Docker containers. The best practice really is to audit and drop all the capabilities that aren't actually used by the container. So unless you explicitly have a need to bind to a port or something like that, don't allow that. Yes, sir. Uh, you can, you can do it programmatically or, or you can also just kind of look at it from a common sense perspective. Like take a look and what is my application doing? If I don't have a need to bind to a privileged port or if I don't have a need to um, manipulate file systems or something like that, you can actually drop those privileges uh, on the command line. Or if you look, this is actually the, um, the default template for Docker and this shows the privileges that um, are allowed and then also it shows like namespaces that are allowed as well. So you can see this programmatically. Yes, sir. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so you can you can see what privileges are enabled by default, and then you can also use security tools. You can either run like uh, S trace against it, or you can uh, use whatever your whatever auditing tools you're most familiar with to see sort of what calls are being made. And if you don't have a specific need for it, you can disallow it. So the sysadmin, when you say it's a catch-all, does it include? some of these other capabilities or is it capabilities that are not included in others? It is only those capabilities which don't fit into one of those other 38 categories. So if I give someone sysadmin, it doesn't mean they can bind to a port under 1024, for example. You right, that right. At that point, you would actually use to, need to grant them the Linux capabilities for, I think it's called NetBind? CapNet Admin. CapNet Admin, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so. Again, it's kind of a catch-all, um, and so, uh, there's a ton of stuff in Capsys Admin that's like just random stuff that didn't fit anywhere else. So yeah. So let's talk a little bit about security enhanced Linux. So that's Linux capabilities. Security enhanced Linux is a mandatory access control system. <laughs> Processes, files, memory, network interfaces, and so on all have SE Linux labels, um, and there is a policy on how those processes, actually how the labels can interact with each other. That, that, uh, that policy is administratively set and fixed. The policy will determine how processes can interact with files, with other processes, network ports, and so on. Um, and SE Linux is primarily concerned, or at least for the, the context of this presentation, is really concerned with labeling and type enforcement. For, let's say we have a mythical service called the Foo service. Um, the executable on disk might have the label foo exec t or foo exec executable type. Uh, the startup script might be foo config type. The log files might be foo log type. Uh, the data might have the label foo data type. When foo is running, the process in memory would probably have the label foo type. So type enforcement is just the rules that say that when a process running in the foo type context 
tries to access a file on the file system with foo config type or foo data type, that access would be allowed. And that makes sense, right? You want the foo process to be able to read its config files and its data. Um, when the process foo type tries to write to a log file with foo log type, that would be allowed as well. That's part of the SE Linux policy. Um, any other access though, unless explicitly allowed by policy is denied. So if the foo process running in the foo type context tries to access, for instance, the directory slash home slash T Cameron that has the user home directory type, even if the permissions are wide open, if that's not specifically allowed, if the process running in the foo type context tries to access a directory with the home dir type, it will be denied. So SE Linux labels are stored on the uh, file system as extended attributes or managed in memory by the kernel. So SE Linux labels are stored in the format, the uh, SE Linux user, the SE Linux role, the SE Linux type, and then multi-level and multi-category security. So for the, this foo service, the full syntax of the running process might be user u, object role, foo type, and then uh, no additional MLS or MCS labels. So when we talk about security enhanced Linux, the default policy for SE Linux is the targeted policy. Uh, we don't use the SE Linux or user, uh, sorry, the SE Linux user or role, so we can ignore those. Um, we do use um, MLS and MCS for uh, things like OpenShift containers, which I'll talk about in a little while. Um, but we really only care about the type because uh, remember this is about type enforcement and the MCS label. Um, think of MCS as just extra identifiers. In SE Linux for containers, we can be super granular about which processes can access which other uh, processes. So even though these are identical, it's user U on both, object role on both, we don't really care about those, but it's the foo type on both, but because we have a difference in the MCS, the multi-category security label, those are, according to SE Linux, totally different. So if I have something that's running in C0 versus C1 and somebody compromises C0 and tries to attack the next container over that's running with C1 or C2 or C3, SE Linux will not allow that access because according to SE Linux, those are totally different. Type enforcement just says that the process with that first label is different from the process with the second label, so policy would prevent them from interacting. There's no policy allowing a process running with those labels to access the file system unless it is labeled explicitly with either foo config type or foo content type or another defined label. So neither of those processes would be able to access, say, Etsy Shadow or the home directories or anything like that because that SE Linux label is so different, okay? So on a standalone system running Docker, all of the containers run in the same context by default. In OpenShift though, every container gets spun up with a separate context. So you'd have you know, the OpenShift type, C0, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, and so on. So even if somebody were uh, able to gain access to the Docker container process on the host, SE Linux would prevent them from attacking other containers or the host itself. So in the following example, I'll show you what this looks like. What I do is I emulate somebody who exploits a container. Um, I use runcon, which changes, the, uh, con uh, changes what context I'm running in, to set my context to that of an OpenShift container. I attempt to access the Etsy shadow file, try to write to the file system, try to read from a home directory, and you'll see that even though I am running as root, I get blocked. So here I'm running as root, right? And then what I do is I run the ID command and I can see that I'm running in the, the unconfined space. Now I use the runcon command to change to an unconfined user system role as the OpenShift type. Remember that SE Linux is about type enforcement and labeling. So I'm gonna run as the OpenShift type and um, I'm gonna run the bash command. And the interesting thing is, as soon as I run that command, I get an error message saying, whoop, I can't read the contents of the bash RC file. Um, so if I try to cat Etsy shadow, for instance, even though I'm still running as root, I don't have access to Etsy shadow. I try to create a test file in the root of the file system, permission is denied. Even though I'm running as root, because I'm running 
in the OpenShift context when I try to access Home T Cameron, for instance. Uh, it doesn't allow me to do that because my SE Linux context has changed. And even though I'm running as root, if I say, well, that's okay, I'm just going to turn off SE Linux. If I try to run set and for zero, it's going to fail as well. So this is an example of how changing to the context of an OpenShift container or any container um, is still not going to allow me to have access to the file system. All right. So let's talk about SecComp. SecComp is syscall filtering. So you can match system calls or even their arguments for more specific matches like kill, error no, uh, allow, trap, trace, etc. You can either use whitelist or blacklists. Uh, and Docker uses a whitelist by default. So what it does is you can potentially disable system calls like kexec load, init module, fnit module, um, delete module, ioperm, swap on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and disable 32-bit um, syscalls. So in this example, and this is one of the ones that Brunal did, he actually created a JSON file um, that basically <laughs> it, it, it blocks the get cwd command. So, which is kind of silly, you would never really do that in the real world because that's a really important system call. But it's a great example in that what he does is he runs Docker run IT and then he says security op uh, options include reading that set comp, that JSON file. And when he runs uh, BusyBox with the SH command, so just give me a shell, um, it <laughs> says, nope, from operations not permitted. So I can't see what directory I'm in. If he does PWD and the operation is not, uh, is not allowed. So it's a silly example, but it's a good example of showing how you can take even core system calls, blacklist them through a file, and if you make that part of the command line to launch your uh, containers, you can block those system calls. All right, so let's talk about some tips and tricks, some of the things that you want to do and some of the things that you don't want to do. Remember that containers at the end of the day are just processes running on your host. Um, so use common sense when you're running those processes. Make sure that you do have a process in place to update your containers and follow that process. Don't just download some container from Docker Hub and then run it in your environment and don't update it. You have to have a process in place for running updates. Always make sure that you run your containers with the lowest possible privilege. Drop unused capabilities as soon as you can. When you mount file systems from the host, if you can, mount them as read-only. That way you don't grant any access to write information back to the host. Um, treat root inside of the container just like you would root on the host. Run your containers as non-root if possible. So if you can run, for instance, a MySQL container, run it as a MySQL user. This is uh, actually enforced on OpenShift. So if you use our, our PaaS offering, either the commercial version, OpenShift Enterprise, or the upstream open source version, OpenShift Origin, uh, we do enforce that. Have a mechanism in place to watch your log files, because if something weird is happening in your environment, it should get logged and you can react to that and make changes. And uh, enable no new privileges for your container if possible. Uh, so you'd run Docker Run IT, you know, Fedora Bash, dash dash security opt, no new privileges. That way, even if somebody does manage to try to do something bad inside of the container, we're going to block them. Don't just download Bill and Ted's excellent container from the internet. Um, try to use trusted sources, whether it's the Docker repository, you know, look at the history of your Docker image, make sure that it's something that's being updated and keep, uh, kept smart. Um, don't just download any old container. Don't run SSH inside of the container. That's kind of defeats the purpose of containers. You want to build your container and push them out. You don't want to have to log into them and do updates. Um, don't run with root privileges. In other words, drop privileges as quickly as possible. Don't disable SE Linux. Please. If you don't understand how SE Linux works, if the, the discussion that we had today is not enough, I did a video at uh, Red Hat Summit called SE Linux for Mere Mortals. It's on YouTube. Go watch it. It's only about 45 minutes. It's a pretty good explanation of how SE Linux works. If you're not comfortable with SE Linux, turning it off is not the right answer. Yes, sir. What kind of interaction? 
reactions are there when someone runs a Debian or Ubuntu kernel which doesn't use SE Linux on an SE Linux system? So they don't have so, context on files in the container. So inside of the container, SE Linux won't be enabled. That's bad. It's not a showstopper, but it's definitely not good. But at least that container running on a Fedora host or on a RHEL host or on a CentOS host, at least that container will be protected by security enhanced Linux. So even if somebody does compromise that Debian container, they won't be able to attack other containers on the host. You know, I recommend, and this is not a dig on Debian or a dig on Ubuntu or anything like that. I recommend that you use containers that do understand SE Linux. If SE Linux is, is at, you know, at least the file system labeling and things like that are happening within the container. Um, there are no conflicts. I don't. I don't know if App Armor would actually run inside of the container. I'm just not sure. I haven't, I haven't tried it. So the same kernel. So yeah. If it's SLinux outside, it could be SLinux inside too. Yeah. I, I I don't know. I haven't tested that. Um, I haven't tested it. But my recommendation is you know use SE Linux aware sure. containers. Um, it's not always practical, but at least if you're running a container that doesn't grok SE Linux, at least that container is still protected by the host. Uh, let's see. Don't roll your own containers once and then never maintain them. I see that a lot. You know, some developer somewhere gets asked, hey, will you create something for me? The developer creates it, gives it over to the ops team, and then the developer is on to the next project. Don't do that. Have a lifecycle management process in place. Uh, and don't run production containers on unsupported platforms. The wild, wild west is not the place to do production. All right, so in conclusion, we're right at the end. Go forth and contain. Containers are incredibly cool technology. They make deployment really, really easy. If anyone sat through Adam's uh, session on the previous, uh, uh, previous hour where he talked about how to build layered containers, there's some amazingly cool technology going on around the building and deployment of containers. Um, containers do leverage some incredibly cool capabilities within a Linux kernel, and by, by design, they are relatively secure. Nothing's perfect, um, but if you follow just kind of common sense rules of software lifecycle management, containers can be very, very secure um, they can make your business more agile, or your organization, your community more agile, and uh, potentially less complex. And if done right, they can be very, very safe. So with that, any questions? Yes, sir. I wanted to ask about SC Linux. Uh, is SC Linux actually uh, like confining processes running inside containers? My, my understanding was that it's wrapping with s words of label only processes uh, which belong to the container, but it do doesn't care about what happens inside the container, so it's right. like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> so just in. Um, yes, so there are, right now, SE Linux really only cares about the process running on the host. So that, that container process running on the host is, is confined within SE Linux and we have rules around it. Um, I've actually run a bunch of Fedora containers that have, uh, and I've found that SE Linux inside of the container is turned off. Um, I'm not sure what the status of having SE Linux inside the container turned on is yet. I actually meant to go bug Dan about that while I'm here. Um, do, you, do you know time frame or roadmap? We're not going to do that. It's not going to happen? It's just not going to happen. There's a lot of, I mean, we can sit down, but in, to keep it simple for this question, there's technical reasons. Okay. We're not going to namespace SE Linux. Really? Okay, so there's your answer. All right. Thank you. So I had hoped that it was a not yet, but apparently it's a no. So yes. uh, speaking of SR Linux, uh, we use it uh, for some stuff like uh, WordPress. We do not want WordPress to send email because right, that's WordPress, so it's going to mm -hmm. send spam. Is there an easy way to do that with Docker? Say so this container can only receive connection, but cannot contact anyone outside, or I have to do that by end with a. Uh, Right. Um, the best way, so the question is, is there a way to secure systems so they don't accept new connections? Uh, they can accept or they, they do can create new ones. Oh, okay, so they outside. can't do outbound? Yeah. Um, so you can do that a number of ways. IP tables, for me, would probably be the easiest way. 
Um, yeah. Um, but you can have SE Linux policy. Um, you could have SE Linux policy that that would block outbound. I think that would probably be a lot more work than it, than just an IP tables rule set. Um, I'm not even sure how I would do that. You could. Uh, yeah, I would use IP tables. Uh, there's a site where you are blacklisting the system calls. Is it possible inside the container to modify the system call? So you are actually thinking that you are using this system call, but you are using a different one. So this kind of... So it's this called mapping, basically? Exactly, like exactly abstraction? Like five, uh, yeah. five I'm sure that it can be done. I don't know how to do it. Um, so so set code. Docker uses lib set code, yeah. and there's certain things like um, the big ones are socket and IPC, yeah. right? Yeah. They're multiplexed and very good. Lib set code takes care of that magically for you on the right platforms. And in fact, if you follow lib set code, the recent change that went into, I think it was a 4.3, where um, Andy made, <laughs> he hooked up all the uh, all the socket syscalls so that they can be both direct wired and through the socket call syscall. Um, so there's about 87 different ways on 32-bit x86 you can call socket, and libsetconf will just take care of those for you. It should, if it doesn't, it's a bug. Let me yeah, <laughs> file a bug if not. Yeah. Yeah. All right, was this helpful? Good, okay, any other questions? Why, why the whitelist rather than blacklist? So I don't I don't know the answer to that. Um, I've I've heard a couple of different versions. Do you know why we chose whitelist by default instead of blacklist by default? I you can and it's funny this just came up maybe a couple weeks ago too. Um, you can actually do both. Um, like QEMU, I, I don't know what status that was, but they use syscall filtering also. And uh, there was some talk about doing a um, an initial uh, blacklist. And then, you know, for setup, because QEMU does a lot of stuff to mm -hmm. get the VM running. And then right before you actually say go to the VM, you know, you, you tighten that down um, a bit further. Um, you could do something very similar uh, with containers. The thought was being that, for example, um, let's say there's a kernel vulnerability found that a syscall invoked with these particular arguments, I'm not going to call anybody out, but I article, um, <laughs> you know, you could, you could have your normal. Um, your normal list, and then you could quickly throw in a specific, you know, a separate additional syscall filter to isolate and say, okay, I don't want you to call ACL with this specific. So, similar to what, what? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. sure where that stands, but there was some discussions around that. Um, I'm not too involved with Docker Yeah, I, the, the, the explanation that I heard, but this was kind of third, third hand, was, um, if you blacklist by default, then you have to explicitly go through and allow everything that you want to have happen. Um, if you whitelist by default, then you really are going back and, and basically blocking the things you don't want. And I think that the nod was made to usability before security, uh, which there are arguments for both sides. Um, it's kind of like, why don't you use the um, strict SE Linux policy by default? Well, because it's a pain in the ass. And it's really hard to go through and open everything up that needs to be opened up to make your system usable. I get the impression that it was, we're going to choose whitelist by default and only turn off those functions that we don't want. Because if you do blacklist by default and you forget to turn something on, the user experience is going to be terrible. Now, that's third hand. Don't take that as gospel. I think that's a pretty good argument. I think it's a fair <laughs> argument. I mean, there's always the balance, right? you got security over here. And the more security goes up, the less usability is there. So... That's, again, that's kind of what I heard in a side conversation, so I think that's the case. All right, guys, um, we are, we got seven minutes left if anybody has any other questions. Otherwise, go get some coffee, have a cigarette break, whatever. Thank you.